It's a great country. Protecting it is a great way of life. The United States Air Force. Find out how you can be part of it. Aim high. Air Force. Welcome, everybody, to Turn Files. I'm Jimmy Young. And today, we are going to be talking about enlisting into the Vermont Guard. I have um, a couple of folks that are recruiters there. And I'd like for them to introduce themselves, starting off with the Army side. Hi, everyone. I am Sergeant Kelsey Ward. I'm a recruiter out of Swanton, Vermont. Um, I have been in the Army for it'll be five years in four days. And I, I love it. It's great so far. Air Guard. What's going on, y'all? Uh, Staff Sergeant Freeman Degbo. I'm one of the recruiters out here in the Vermont Air National Guard. Um, we recruit right out of, well, the whole state of Vermont and certain part of New York. Uh, yep. Good afternoon, everybody. Mass Sergeant Juan Coleman. I'm the flight chief for the Vermont Air National Guard recruiting and retention team. I've been in the Air Guard now for about 11 years, actually April 27th was 11 years. So time flies, pun intended. Um, definitely uh, excited about where I'm currently at and helping as far as recruiting and retention goes. So thank you for having me today, Jamie. Greatly appreciate it. Not a problem. Um, well, seeing that this is just gonna be a um, conversation on everything that uh, you guys do in, with uh, enlisting people. Um, one thing that I noticed during the pandemic so far is that you guys have relied mostly on social media and not so much in person like you used to. Definitely. Yeah, I know I've struggled with getting into high schools, which I understand because they're trying to combat COVID. Um, so I have been turning to social media like Facebook, Instagram, and that's pretty much the only platforms I use because um, I have noticed that our target demographic does use those platforms to communicate even more than phone calls and texting. So that's been my go-to recently. What about you guys with the Air Guard side? Well, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's more so about educating as opposed to, uh, you know, recruiting. It's always more about educating and getting people to know who we are and what we stand for and do. So social media yeah, has been a big thing. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, but um, into the enlistment process, um, typically you would sit down with somebody that's interested in enlisting. Um, what is, the typical um, enlistee asking, say, because I, I had my questions um, when I was enlisting and uh, some of them was, um, what does, how much do you have to score on the ASVAB, the Armed Forces Vocational Battery Test? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, for our side, it's a it's a 31 um, to pass the ASVAB itself, but then there's, I think, 10 different line scores that you have to get to qualify for a job. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's how that works for our side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you guys? It's actually, what's that? It's actually, the same, it's actually the same for the air side, too. You need a minimum of a 31 to be able to do anything at all in the air guard. Mm -hmm. Um. What, you know, um, when I enlisted, I uh, went in at the age of 34. Uh, currently, what is the age? Uh, for Army off? side? Yeah, definitely. For Army side, um, your 35th birthday is the cutoff for age, but we have been having really good success with age waivers up to like 40 years old. Mm -hmm. So that's been really beneficial for our recruiting efforts. Yeah. yeah. Um, is it the same with you guys? 
No, actually for the air side, uh, you need to be enlisted by your 40th birthday. So you need to be in the military before you turn 40. And we do not do age waivers when it comes to that. So 40 is the age cut off for um, the air guard side. Right, yes. Okay. Just information for people. If, no, it's good. Yeah. Good question. Um, but, um, and this is something that I remember um, talking to the recruiters way back when, and also to my Naval Science instructor and all that. The ASVAB is not the same test every time. And that's- There's a few different versions, I believe. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. Um, there's what, two or three different versions? Mm -hmm. Many different versions. I believe there's a few different versions. And, and because of that, um, they do that because kids can take it a couple times and kind of remember questions and know the answers they did last time they probably got wrong mm -hmm. um so the next time they go they'll probably get a different version of it um but it all scores out the same and it it's all the same and it tests your knowledge yeah 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 and and, and it is a very if you want to try something that um is challenging the ASVAB even if you're not enlisting is right it does test your knowledge yeah, no. that's why a lot of high schools do give it. So it's it shows you if you'll be good in in maintenance mechanical or the healthcare field or um, mm -hmm. culinary. There's a bunch of different um, topics of jobs that we have um, that kids can take it in high school and see where they would be a good fit for, even if it's not for the military. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but. Um, When it comes to um, physical requirements and health standards, um, mm -hmm. and this is um, when you first enlist, but also throughout your entire service career. Yeah, Air Guard, do you guys want to start that topic? I feel like I've been taking up a lot of the conversation. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Uh, Amy, could you just reiterate the question? Kind of what well, it's it's on the uh, physical and the physical requirements and the uh, health standards that are required for somebody that's enlisting, but also the requirements for the for all those that are in the service. Okay, so you want to know what the physical requirements are? Yes. Yeah. Before before enlisting. Okay, so. What individuals have to do is they have to go to what's called MEPS. So you're familiar with that, the military interest and processing station. And what happens is based actually, off of actually, a, um, I don't, I, I, I probably did, but my memory is foggy. <laughs> okay. okay, so I, I got you. Okay, I got you. I got you. So we uh, send our applicants or potential individuals who are interested in, in going further in the process to what is known as MEPS, which is called the Military Entrancing Processing Station. What they do at MEPS is they take what's called the ASVAB, Armed mm -hmm. Services Vocational Aptitude Battery Test, which is what we just finished discussing. And then the second leg of that visit, which happens the second day they go down, mm -hmm. excuse me, the second day that they're at MEPS, is they take the physical. That's based on, from the Air Guard side, it's based off of 164 questions. Mm -hmm. And it just asks different things with regards to, you know, your eyes, your ears, uh, upper extremities, lower extremities, things of that nature. And what that does is, is based off of those answers, that's how the doctors at MEPS determine if you are physically qualified and eligible to continue on in the process and eventually enlist with us. Okay, okay, because when I was enlisting, that whole process that you explained, first I took the ASVAB, okay. and this is back in 98. Right. I took the ASVAB, continued to work with the recruiter, then I went to, um, over, and it's off of, um, Heinsberger Road, to this medical place that they were working with at the time to do the vision, the hearing, and all that stuff. Then 
a little later on, I got together with a um, couple of recruiters and then went through the whole strength thing, how much I could lift, how many push-ups, how many setups, so on and so forth. Okay. That's how so that, we... that's, for me, that's how that all played out. Okay, so, and the reason why I clarify this, even when I'm talking to applicants is because, mm -hmm. or, you know, the way we train here, as far as the way the production recruiters are to speak to applicants, a lot of people are under the assumption that when we say physical, they're thinking push up, sit ups, mile and a half run. At, yeah. At yeah. The, 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 none, yeah. Go ahead. There's none of that there. Excuse me. Go ahead. There's none of that there, but they do do a weight lift test just from a machine. We mm -hmm. do a weight lift. A certain job requirements require the individual to be able to lift a certain amount of weight to do that job proficiently. Okay. Okay. So yep. that we whole thing well. had, has changed a lot since I enlisted in 98. Oh, definitely. We don't do the... Oh, definitely. Actually, what you're saying, Jamie, as far as having things get checked out before the person goes to MEPS and all of that stuff, it's kind of like, it sounds like y'all actually had a pre-MEPS station here before you go and, and do, do the main could, stuff. Could be, could be. But, um, the, um, and this is something that very few people, even those that have been involved in scouts, junior ROTC, and even the Civil Air Patrol are completely unaware of. And that's that what they had done in those organizations is considered to be not prior service, but pre-service. Meaning that those that have, like say I did four, I did a couple of years of junior ROTC. <clears throat> because I took junior ROTC, I went in at a higher pay grade. Is that still being done within the guard and the service on the overall? Yeah, like certain credentials that you have like that can get you in as a higher pay grade, um, mm -hmm. which in turn will give you a bump in pay at basic training and AIT. So, Degbo, you want to? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, it's pretty much the same on our side. Uh, if you get certain things such as uh, Eagle Scout, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you're part of ROTC Civil, uh, Civil Air Patrol for a certain amount of years. Uh, you bring us the certificates, it does bring you in as an E3, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and that's equivalent of having up to 45 college credits or 32 college credits. So it's definitely something that a lot of the younger guys should look into. Yeah, and especially those that have been involved in um, these organizations that, um, that they find an interest in because of the technology that they are pursuing or the career field that they'd like to get in. Yeah, but, definitely, um, especially with um, JROTC, you must be in that program because you have an interest in military at least, you know, and, and having that program under your belt when you do go to join, because assuming you want to join eventually because you're in that program now, um, that'll bump you up even further in your career once you enlist. So that's, it's a great idea for those kids who are in JROTC right now. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just me being curious. Is there any junior ROTC programs left in the state of Vermont? Yes. Where? There's three. Uh, Enosburg, where else do we have it? Spalding High School, and one Newport. more. And Newport. Newport. Yep. Okay, so Essex no longer has their Air Force Junior ROTC. They do not. No. That's a shame. That's a shame. <laughs> and those other uh, Junior ROTCs are Army? All of them are Army, right? Are they combined? They're all run by the Army. No, they're all ran by the Army. Okay, okay. Um, but yeah, that's something that um, a lot of these kids that are in that program should think about if they do want to pursue certain uh, fields. Yeah, and they're getting a leg up already in that program. So mm -hmm. why not keep moving forward, you know? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and you never know, some of them may end up going to the academy or go to uh, Norwich or something like that. But um, when it comes to um, the overall career fields, um, that I don't know what happened there. <laughs> Um, what are the differences between the two? Because I know there's a lot of similarities between the Vermont Air Guard and the Vermont Army Guard, i.e. they both have their security forces that are there. But beyond that, and basically both of their, uh, well, the Air Wing and the air unit that the Army Guard have, what are the overall differences with the uh, basic training um, and all the uh, different career fields in a nutshell? Definitely. Um, so our basic training lasts for 10 weeks. Um, your first like week, week and a half is called reception. So that's where you go down and you go through all your shots, make sure your paperwork's all good. Um, they do all your medical, um, they check your eyes, we need glasses, we'll get glasses there. It's, it's what's known as the worst part of basic, but everybody has to go through it um, to make sure you're good to go for training. And then um, you have full eight weeks of um, basic. So we have red phase, white phase, and blue phase. And for us, red phase is the kind of the intro phase. You're getting to know everybody. Um, you're doing some like um, team building exercises and stuff. You do PT every morning. Uh, white phase is made up mostly of um, weapons training, um, so a lot of a lot of, a lot of uh, target shooting and stuff. So you get very very familiar with your with your weapon, your rifle, mm -hmm. and then um, moving out of white phase into blue phase, we'll definitely do a lot more uh, what they call confidence courses, but I like to call them adult playgrounds. So they're very fun. Um, you're kind mm -hmm. of working together as a team to get through obstacles, um, and you get ready for graduation and all that at the end of blue phase. Um, and then you move on to your job school. So we call it AIT, it's advanced individual training. So whatever you score on the ASVAB and you pick for your job, that's where the job school you'll go to is. Um, and the length of that depends on the severity of the job. So for myself, I joined up to 35 Fox, which is an intelligence analyst. And my job school alone was 16 weeks out in uh, Sierra Vista, Arizona, which is a great experience for me because I never had been out West. So thanks to the army, it was paid for. Um, and I came out of that with a top secret government clearance, which is a very expensive clearance to have. So I'm pretty thankful for that. Um, but I mean, moving into the different jobs that we have, um, I guess we could, if you guys want to talk about your basic training experience before moving into that, I think if we chop it up that way, it might be easier for kids to understand. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Uh, well, our basic training, it's a little different from uh, the army side. Uh, mm -hmm. Typically, it's about eight and a half weeks long. So you have zero week where they get there, they have no idea where they're getting themselves into, right? Uh, they go through the reception phase, uh, you know, get their dorm and whatnot. And the way it's structured is morning is PT. And during the day, everything is by appointment. So they might do um, marching for an hour or so, learning how to march, and then they go to a medical appointment for their initial shots. And then there's another appointment where they get their hair cut. So everything is by appointment. Then they have a lot of classroom time because on the air side is a lot of studying and studying and studying. Um, we also have Beast Week where they leave the squadron and go to a remote location on the same base where they get familiar with obstacle courses and learning how to shoot their weapons, um, going through the gas chamber and whatnot. Um, oh, gas chamber. Yep. Uh, <laughs> for that, I remember that. It's quite fun. Oh yeah. Um, well, basically, you're doing three PT tests. The first two don't really count. The last one counts towards your graduation. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you graduate, you pipeline right through to what we call technical training. So the Army side is AIT. We call it tech school, where you learn the very basics of your job. And the length, just like on the Army side, it varies by AFSE career field. In my case, I was a crew chief, aircraft mechanic, so I was gone a total of nine months, and that includes basic training and tech school. So that was nine months of full-time pay that my pocket mm -hmm. was getting. So that was great. Oh yeah. 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 Sounds like we have a lot of similarities with our 
our trainings. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Jamie? Yeah. Real quick, one of the things I just wanted to highlight, if you don't mind, is with regards to the basic training and everything, what we do uh, on the air side as far as once a person enlists is they start coming here for drills, doing mm -hmm. their drill weekend, one weekend a month. And they're in what's called training and developmental flight. So they're in that flight with other people who are waiting to go to the basic training as well. And what that allows people to do is get acclimated to, you know, the structure and they're going over, you know, regulations and practicing marching and PTing and, and getting in shape and, and things of that nature. So that actually when they go down to basic, it's not as much of a shock. And we're seeing a good uh, ROI on that because we got a lot more kids going down now, getting, you know, honor and distinguished graduates and getting the warrior hawk and the PT awards and things like that. So it's just about not completely tossing them in there there and, and not knowing what's going on, but but giving them some preparation uh, prior to going. So that helps yeah, a that's lot. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you guys had that program. Um, um, so we have the same thing, but it's called RSP. I'm sure you guys know about that. It's the recruit sustainment yeah. program. Um, same concept. You're basically just getting getting them to yeah. learn the ropes before they go down, all of what they said, plus like the rank structure, some medical and training. You guys do that too, I assume. Um, yeah, definitely. <clears throat> our, our, our FSF chief is a former Blue Road TI from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, basic training. So he was really giving the kids as realistic as it could be. That's you know, good. Was, yeah, that is good. Up, that is good. Yeah. Awesome. And it's it's crazy when you uh when you go down to training because I remember my RSP days, my the recruit statement program days, the pre basic training drills. Um, you could tell who was guard and who was active duty because you're comfortable and everybody is doing the right thing and you know they're from the guard and the active duty guys are turning left when they're supposed to turn right and they're the ones <laughs> getting yelled at and. <laughs> It's funny, so but it's a super beneficial program to have. That way, you're comfortable and you know what you're doing. You go into it. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So, how long is this program being in effect? In effect? Hmm. Do you have questions about? It's been a while. Uh, it's been ongoing since about 2004 mm -hmm. on the Army Guard side. All right. So my boss is here with me too, just to help me out with questions I don't know, which was that one. And uh, apparently, our RSP program has been around since 2004. What about you guys? So I came in in 2009, 10 slash 10, and it was around then. It's been around for, for quite some time. I don't have a specific year, but I'd say long enough that we've definitely made improvements because, you know, when mm -hmm. something's around that long, you can kind of see what works and what doesn't. So it mm -hmm. used to be called student flight, and the name just recently changed a couple of years ago to training and developmental flight. Yeah, you know? it's probably been around as long as the air or the army side has been around too. I'm sure the tag has kind of implemented that program. I would assume anyway, to yeah, benefit yeah. both both guard sides for sure. Yeah, and this is for mostly for those that go in on the uh, delayed entry. So entry that's mostly active duty. Um, it's about the same concept except I mean, what I mean, what I mean is those that go in with the guard on delayed entry. You mean to the to those programs? Right. So for us, um, that program happens when there is a certain amount of time between your enlistment and when you leave for basic training. So, for example, I enlisted in October, or sorry, in May, and didn't mm -hmm. leave until that October. So each month, I had one weekend of RSP drills. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Which also yeah. prepares you for when you're back in your unit, you have that one week in a month drill and all those drills for us, I'm sure they are for you too, Air Guard, um, but they're paid you as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So that's yeah. cool too. So these, these kids start getting some paychecks before they leave and they're getting the knowledge and everything they need to be prepared for training. Yeah. 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 Because um, that's just kind of a curiosity of mine because when I was going to the overall enlistment, I was working with a recruiter at the time. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned to him, because I was also driving for Domino's, and if I could go in at, because of my age with the delayed entry, he checked into it and I could. 
So that was like, cool. So my whole idea, if I didn't get discharged, was to work it out with the guard to spend time there learning from the crew chiefs. So where when I went off to everything, I would be that just, you know, just that much ahead. Right, right. So I see what you mean there, Jimmy. Uh, so on our side, at least, when you, when, you, when, you, when you enlist, we do work with you to try to figure out when it's best for you to ship out to boot camp. Mm -hmm. So that is something to look into. Uh, we don't just, you know, immediately send folks. Right, because uh, everybody has something different going on in their lives, so we do work with them a little as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Because it was kind of funny. I met um, a guy, former crew chief. For a while, he was with the air guard, but before then, he was stationed here at Plattsburgh. The day that I was discharged, I was supposed to go with him and just follow him around. He thought that I went off for basic. That oh. day when we both met up again over at the Plains, he recognized me, I did not recognize him. And it's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. right. So, so Jamie, real quick, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say, I have to step out. I have another appointment that I have not to a problem. To. But I wanted to thank you, Carl Ward. Keep killing it over there. I see what y'all doing. I'm mm -hmm. going to let my man here, Freeman Degbo, finish up, and he's going to give me the AAR after this is over. And let us know if there's anything else we can do to help you out. Okay, not a problem. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. It's good to have that community support. Yep. We love All our right. – over here in Plattsburgh, we, we miss the air base being active. We do. Yeah, no, I used to I used to recruit over there a lot. So that was my area when I was a young production recruiter. Yeah. So yeah, I love going over there and stopping at Chick-fil-A. It's awesome. You have to go to Chick-fil-A. You have to yeah. go to Plattsburgh. You have yeah. to. The number one, I'm telling you, good. <laughs> I'm partial to the coffee can. Right, right. All right, man. Right. Okay. Um Oh, let's see here now. Um, and this is something that the recruiter and I went over during basic, as, I mean, um, during the whole enlistment. Um, how does the Air Guard do with the continuing education, college? Um, and other benefits like um, health insurance and so on. You know, what type, you know, college benefits do they offer? Health benefits? Big boy, you wanna go ahead and get that one? Is it healthy? Um, yeah, do you, wanna, do you wanna start with that? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. So, you know, first off, a lot of, you know, one thing most people don't realize uh, is that the military now is not what it is what it was 15 years ago. Uh, it's actually pretty challenging when it comes to education. Um, mm -hmm. They're big on that. So, you know, and we mentioned things like basic military training and then AIT or technical training where it's literally a school program run by the Air Force, by the Air Force or the Army. Mm -hmm. Now on our side, the Air Force has its own air university and a community college. It's called the Community College of the Air Force. And it is accredited. So as folks go through technical training and they come back, they return to college credits that they can transfer to any universities or colleges of their choice. Mm -hmm. um, in the last two and a half years, I believe the state of Vermont finally got a state tuition assistance program which is through VSAC. So you have certain schools such as UVM, VTC, and VU where the tuition is fully covered. Mm -hmm. And you can any also any in-state yeah. in college right. that's considered an in-state Vermont college. Yep. So there's uh, CCV, uh, VTC, there is um, NVU, UVM, and Castleton. Right. I think at Elm. Yeah. So that's definitely super ben beneficial for both Army and Air side um, yeah. for, for benefit into joining. So that's, that's helping our recruiting efforts for sure. Uh, what right. about those 
guard members that are on the New York side that would like, how can they do the same thing over here? If they well, don't want to go, if they don't want to travel over to Vermont, but they want to go to either Plattsburgh State or Clinton Community. You mean New York, New York residents? Yeah, that are Vermont and, Guard members. That are Vermont Guard members. Yeah. Um, I mean, they can use uh, student loan repayment for us if they qualify for it. So that's up to fifty thousand dollars of student loan repayment. That's if they already have student loans or if they plan on um, getting student loans by going to college. Um, they can use the Montgomery GI Bill. So mm -hmm. those those are available at other colleges, but um, definitely the main thing is if they do want to use a Vermont school, being in the Vermont Guard, they can go tuition free. Right, and on our, on our mm -hmm. side, we do not have a loan repayment program. Mm -hmm. If they live on the New York side, if there is, let's say, there's a certificate program that they're trying to get, and it, it's not offered in Vermont, they could use the state tuition assistance. But the thing behind it, it's it's the Vermont taxpayers' money. Right. So they want it to be used right here in Vermont. So, yeah, that's, you know, and I all of them just once you're part of the Vermont Air National Guard or Army National Guard in Vermont, you consider it in state. So you, right. you go to Vermont school and save yourself some money as opposed to taking loans. Yeah. So those yeah. that want to save a shitload of cash, they right. want to go to college and finish up a degree that they've been working on or something like that. Their best option is to try and get something over in Vermont right. and commute to and from. Yeah, we're not sure what the like New York National Guard has for tuition benefits or anything right now. Um, we're focused on ours to build our community yeah. up yeah, that, um, and to keep people here. So that's yeah, that's understandable. That's, that's understandable. Definitely. I'm sure that New York, the New York Guard is doing the same thing. I hope so. <laughs> it's yeah. a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah, well, keeps people happy. That's right. Um, when it comes to the health insurance, what's the story on that? Um, so we have TRICARE, I'm sure you guys do too, Digbo, right? Yep. Um, and there's, so there's life insurance that we can get, um, it's $400,000 worth of life insurance that you can get with a very low payment of like, I think $29 a month. Mm -hmm. um, so that's awesome. And then we have like monthly healthcare plans. Um, and if you want it just for yourself, it's about $46 a month. Mm -hmm. um, and for yourself and your family, if you're married with kids or have kids or just married, either way, um, it's like about $221 roughly. Um, and dental is extremely cheap too. It's $11 a month for just you. And then for you and your family, it's around like $85. I think yeah, so and, and much less more, than what you'd pay through state. <laughs> yeah. And most part-time guard members can afford that. Oh, definitely. And that's, you can afford that with a drill check, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Easy. Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, when it comes to um, say, say you guys had to go down for um, some schooling what uh, travel benefits does the uh, guard pay? Say so you have uh, to go down to Florida for some training. Uh, anytime we go to training, it's fully reimbursed. Yeah. Our, our, so like, just clarify the question. Is he asking if like we go out of state, if we go to like, yes, say, yes. California? Say down, say, say down to Florida to do some, some, to take some classes that are only offered down there. Now, are you saying classes like for military training? Military training? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. So yeah, I mean, I mean, flights are covered. Um, expenses are covered that you acquire while you're down there. So like mm -hmm. food's paid for, flights paid for. So we like to call it like a free vacation. <laughs> I mean, while yeah. you're doing school, right? But honestly, yeah, for both sides. I mean, I'm sure you guys that go are everything's paid for as well, right? Because it's something you have to do. Okay. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, you get put on uh, you get put on some type of orders. Mm -hmm. Um, if, you know, they provide you with a flight down there, you book a hotel. Once you get down there, the hotel is booked. And, you know, your main focus is just going through the course. Definitely. Uh, yeah, I know recruiting spoke to me was down in, uh, in Arkansas. And first time I've been there, too, you know, for your trip to a state I've never been to. Um, and they paid you for room and board, yeah. like food. Like, you don't have to. You can go shopping if you want, but that has to be covered by you, right? <laughs> but anything that you're required to do is is reimbursed. 
or cover. Yeah, that, per, that per diem though. Mm, and per diem. Yeah. A little extra, extra cash. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. They, yeah. You know, when it comes to having to do something, the military loves pain. Um, yeah. But um, a little bit um, onto TDYs, detachments, and deployments. And you guys have seen plenty of those. Um, one question that I was posed with is what's the difference between federal deployments and state deployments? Definitely. So this can bring us back to the actual enlistment day. So when guard members of the Vermont Guard, um, Air or Army, I believe this is true for you, correct me if I'm wrong, thank you. Um, but when you swear in, you swear in not only to the President of the United States, but you swear in to the, uh, the Governor of the state, so that way you can be activated for state missions. So um, like Hurricane, um, what was it, Irene, last one in Vermont, I think, a big hurricane. Um, yeah. we, were, we were dispatched for that, so we can be um, activated for those orders. And obviously, so swearing in the president of the, of the United States, you can be activated for deployments as well. For um, for the Army side, we are um, we're kind of on deck every five years, and if we're needed, we'll go. If not, we'll get skipped over, which is fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Um, our last one was uh, 2010, and then we're uh, 2015. We we really didn't need to go anymore, so we didn't. And then um, we're leaving out here soon for a few different locations. Yeah, I'm aware so, of that. I'm aware of yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's and it's pretty much on the on the air side. Uh, I want to clarify one thing that uh, Sergeant Ward says so people don't get confused because I do get this question a lot. Um, when she means swear to the president, it means swear to obey the orders of the president and the orders of the governor of Vermont and the right. orders of the office of the governor of Vermont. Right. So right. we don't swear into right. person right. to the constitution, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to clarify that because. No, it's good. Um, it's good. Yeah. We also, for the state mission, we have sister states. And people mm -hmm. don't know about this, but Senegal and Macedonia, which Senegal is in West Africa, Macedonia is in Europe. And we do training with those states, with those countries. Um, it's just a relationship building. Mm -hmm. um, we also, on the air side, we go to other states, such as Wisconsin, because mm -hmm. they will be getting some new jets soon. So we, we do training with them. Um, mm -hmm. Operation Red Flag is in Vegas. So we do a deployment to Vegas to, you know, for <laughs> air battles. Um, yeah, yeah. And a lot of, uh, <laughs> you know, the planet and a lot of state missions. So right now, both Army and Air, we teamed up and we're doing a lot of COVID efforts. So oh, correct me if I'm wrong, but almost 20,000 vaccines were given by military members and you will not even know because they're mostly in civilian clothes. So there's a lot, a lot more TDYs and state missions than there are federal deployments. But mm -hmm. when we get called, we're always ready, ready mm -hmm. to go and help out. Mm -hmm. Always ready, always there, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <sighs> Don't mind me, I'm just thinking. It's fun. Sometimes it's hard to do for us too. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Um. We're pretty much through stuff. Um. Okay. When it comes to ROTC, OCS, and the academies, um, there's multiple ways of going to those. What are they? Um, for, I know for the army side OCS, so the opposite officer, um, candidate stuff, um, there's a, a year and a half, roughly time frame you can do it in. And there's an accelerated version as well. My, uh, NCIC is here and he can probably speak more on so, that. Uh, so the, the army has the OCS program, the officer candidate school program. And, uh, so that program is, uh, run in a variety of different ways. Uh, we have the traditional program, which takes about a year and a half to gain your commission. Uh, during that time, uh, you do it one weekend a month, approximately a week and a half, uh, two weeks in the summer, um, and you'll achieve your commission at the end of that program. Uh, then we have what's called like the semi-accelerated program. That lasts um, 
not quite uh, a year. It's just under a year uh, where you do some one week in a month drills. Uh, and at the same time, you're also doing some extended week and a half, two week long uh, trainings during that time. And you mm -hmm. achieve your commission at the end of that. We also have the full accelerated program where we send uh, the applicant down to um, Alabama and they mm -hmm. complete uh, the accelerated program. It's about an eight to 10 week program and they commission at the end of it. Uh, so does that answer the question for OCS? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, what what are the routes to go to either, say, the programs that they have down at Norwich, you know, or to, say, West Point or the Air Force Academy? So I can speak to uh, all but the Air Force Academy from the Army side. Mm -hmm. um, as far as Norwich goes, there's a process to, uh, to apply into an ROTC program. You have to do an interview with the PMS, the Professor of Military Science. You have to be accepted to the university. Um, and on the Norwich side, you have to actually um, participate in what's called the Corps of Cadets program, because Norwich mm -hmm. is what's considered a senior military academy. Um, so in order to go to that program and be in the Army ROTC program, uh, you have to be in the Corps of Cadets, unless you're a veteran and that accepts you from that, that requirement. Um, to go to West Point, uh, that's a nomination process uh, out of high school typically. Um, we do have a couple of people through the guard that have achieved that where they came in the guard first and then th that then assisted in them getting nominated. Most of them went through the, um, I'm trying to think of the name of it. It's like the prep school, the West Point prep school. Um, and then they full on went to West Point after that. Okay. Um, so that, that would be the route to go for the service academies, uh, Norwich being a senior military academy uh, that guarantees uh, uh, an active duty commission should you want it. Um, mm -hmm. But you can also commission into the reserve component or the um, National Guard at that time, too. Um, typically, what we see is we put people through there in the uh, what's called a Minuteman scholarship. Right. Um, so that's a National Guard uh, scholarship. It's a full ROTC scholarship, typically four or three year advanced designee scholarships. Um, and they can go and attend, but they commission into the Guard at the end with an eight year commitment on the commission officer side. And why I know all this, I used to work at Norwich University, so. <laughs> <laughs> hey, why not? <laughs> Thank goodness, because I didn't know where to go with that topic, but that's why he's here, just in case. So. What I do. What he's I do. good. He's good. He knows his stuff. Yeah, don't, well, don't, as far I, as the Air Force I, Academy, I, I would, I'll, I'll turn that back over to Sergeant Freeman, because I don't, I don't know about the Air Force Academy. Also. Yeah, well, I, I just want to <laughs> add a little note. Um, when I was in junior ROTC, my uh, Naval Science Instructor, Commander Slaughter, um, he mentioned that another way that you can get into a ROTC program, and this is when St. Mike's had theirs, and I think UVM still has theirs. This is back in the early yeah. 80s anyways, um, was to sign up for the course, pay the two years, and then the next two years are paid for but you still have to do the overall length of time as anybody that are, is active duty. So that is correct. So um, because the ROTC program at University of Vermont, uh, which has satellites at Castleton and Middlebury colleges mm -hmm. uh, here in Vermont, um, it's not a senior military academy at that point. So you have to compete for an active duty commission. So only the top 20% get offered that. Um, but typically what we see is at UVM, most of the students finish in the top 20% because they're wicked smart. Um, and so they, they typically get that, that option to go active duty. But we do commission a lot of officers out of UVM into the Guard. Um, and so the way that program works, you can, you can also apply a Minuteman scholarship into that program. But a lot of times uh, they go kind of like a more traditional route where they just are at the school. They go to the school. They apply into the ROTC program while they're in college. Um, they are a, what's considered a participating member um, mm -hmm. in ROTC at that time. And if they are competitive enough to gain a ROTC contract or an ROTC scholarship at that time, that's when they are committed to the commissioning process. Nice. Does, does that make sense? Does. Does. I'll try to cover it as best I could. Yeah. That's well, important information for people to know. That's how I look at it. It's a uh, lot. <laughs> what about you? Uh, there. Mr. Dogby. How do I follow up with that? Um, <laughs> so actually for the Air Guard, um, we don't commission a lot of, we don't commission officers from ROTC into the Guard because of the way 
uh, officer slots are in the guard. They're very limited. You know, that's, it's actually pretty competitive. Um, but yeah, you know, if you go through ROTC, the hope is to get a, a contract. Now you can enlist in the guard while going through the ROTC program as at Norwich. And once you get offered a contract, we have to release you to active duty. So there is that option. Uh, but what if what if somebody gets their commission and they don't want to go active duty? They just want to stay in the guard. Active duty. If, once you get a contract, and active duty is paying for your program. You go in active duty. <laughs> yeah. No choice. So. So on the, on the, that uh, happened where they let you go. Sorry, Say I didn't mean to interject, but on the Army side, uh, you can convert an active duty scholarship to a guard scholarship uh, on the, on the wow. Army side at the ROTC program. However, it doesn't reciprocate. So once you're on a guard scholarship, you are committed to commissioning in the guard. And just to, Jamie, just to give you an idea of like sheer numbers, uh, when I was working down at Norwich University, the Army ROTC would typically commission uh, anywhere between 80 and 100 commissioned officers out of that university uh, on the Army side. Uh, the Air Force side would commission about uh, 12 to 15. The Navy would be about anywhere from like 15 to 18. And the Marines would be about the same 15 to 18 because they have all branches of the ROTC there. Right. Um, so, you know, it, it is, you know, the Army looks at commissioning in a little bit of a different way where we don't care about the specialty of the, the, the degree, right? We care that you have a degree. Do you have a four-year degree? Yes, you can commission. Um, the, Air, the Air Force, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, if anything's changed, but the Air Force, the Marines, and the Navy, they're looking for specific specialized degrees uh, that you have to participate in while you're at that university in order to accomplish that commission. For the Army, we don't care. We just want to see that you can, you can get, you know, if you can go and, and become an underwater basket weaver, we're good with that. Just get the degree, we'll commission you. You know what I mean? Yes, so, yes. Yeah, well, well, with the Air Force, they would be looking for people that um, know their shit. Hey, yeah, it's all brain. I mean, and, and, and rightfully so. I mean, you're looking for a higher level of uh, intelligence, probably to 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 work on the like the F-35s or to be able to fly an F-35. Like, you're not, you know, yeah. In the Army. We only have we have rotary wing aircraft, and we have a couple fixed wing aircraft and that that's pretty much it. So like our level of intelligence doesn't need to be I'm not, I'm not trying to shortcut it, short change us at all, but we don't need that higher level of intelligence to be able to work on those, those high level pieces of equipment and understand that level of knowledge. Um, Although we do have cybersecurity now. So that's, that's a specialty. <laughs> that's a specialty <laughs> without right, a doubt. <laughs> well, all right now, all branches have that. So yeah, um, something I do want to add is when people think about commissioning, you don't have to go through the ROTC programs or the Air Force Academy or West Point. You can enlist into the into the guard and mm -hmm. take the exam. We have the Air Force Officer Qualifying Test, which is it's like the ASVABs or crack. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty tough. <laughs> Uh, but you take that, you make your minimums. You can put a package in. What that yep. does is. The guard already knows who you are. You've committed to the guard in one way, shape, or form. So right. in that sense, we get more of our own enlisted members because there's no limit. You can enlist a day and take that exam and put in for a commission. Um, but then at least we see that, you know what? You're committed. You want to be here, not just somebody who just graduated from St. Michael's and wants to be an officer, right? So right. It, um, right. So mm -hmm. there, there's different avenues. Basically, whatever you want to gain out of this, like there's people to help you get there, and a yeah. bunch of different pathways. So, yeah. But um, well, I was gonna ask this, but well, eh, why not? What is the difference between full-time guard members and active duty personnel what is the difference um, yeah i get asked that pretty often because a lot of kids who i talk to about enlisting they're like i want to go full time but in the guard um so what i like to say is i wake up i go to work and i get to go home 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 not my barracks not my not my active duty stationed little house i get to go home i get to be surrounded by my family um 
And the best part about that too is we get paid active duty pay. So mm -hmm. we're getting everything that they get, but we get to be here with our with our friends, with our family. So mm -hmm. that's that's nice. Life changes, but not enough to be drastic. Yeah, yeah. So. Not like my family. Uh, <laughs> let's see, California, Texas, Missouri, here. And that's that's yeah. probably minimum for yeah, some it is. people who it is who because I grew up with kids that have been that were stationed here at Plattsburgh for and were six months to two years and they were gone. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hard to make uh, friends that way. Question for my army folks. Can you guys recruit in full time into the guard on the army side? No. No, you have to board yeah. for that. So boarding is like an interview process that you have to go through so so for me i enlisted as a 35 fox went through my training so intelligence went through my basic training my job school um came back i started on um like it's called ados orders which is um active duty operational support so you're kind of just helping out active duty in the guard like full-time guard members so i started out doing recruiting assistance um so those are like chunks of three-month orders if you're doing good you keep going kind of thing you get paid active duty um, but they aren't considered the full-time orders. Um, so I did that for about a year. Then I moved into marketing for the marketing department at Cam Johnson for a full year doing all the social media. And then, um, people really got to know me, like the full-timers got to know who I was, my work ethic and all of that. And then I applied, or I did went to the board for the full-time recruiting spot, which we call AGR as active guard reserve. So that's full-time, that's full-time guard. Um, and I got the job. Um, I prepared for it. I did well. Um, I interviewed very well and I got the job. And now I am full time in the guard, getting all the benefits, getting the gold every night. So that's, that's nice. That's, um, another that's cool. side of that, too, is we also have uh, civilian federal employees here. Um, yes. you know, I, I was going to ask you about that, Freeman. Right. So uh, you, you, you enlist in the guard. You come in one weekend a month and the 15 days in the summertime, but there could be a position some, somewhere that opens up uh, with a requirement that you're already part of the military. So you still have to wear the uniform because it is the uniform for that job. But during the week, you're a federal employee. So you get to double dip where you can retire if you do your 20 years as the federal employee. And you also get a retirement as a guardsman. Uh, but now they're converting, I mean, AGR is better. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but now they're converting a lot of those technician positions into AGR slowly. So mm -hmm. multiple things you can do. There are folks that, are, that have been temporary technicians for the last five years. Um, there are folks that have been temporary AGR for the last five years. And there are those that have been AGR forever. So if you want to be here and you want to be full time, somebody's going to retire. Somebody's going to move. There's always a place. Just show your work ethic and, you know. Um, I was actually challenged into this position. I work for Delta Airlines, as you know. Um, mm -hmm. so I was actually challenged into this position to try to change the narrative of, you know, recruiters are liars or whatnot. So, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which I got to say, I was there when actually at Kelsey Bowl going away party before she went to boot camp. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had to call a sergeant first. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, good stuff. Okay. And, and this is something that I don't know if you both can answer, but what if, say, somebody's interested in working, who's a civilian, who is interested in working for the guard, not wearing the uniform, but just working for the guard, how would they go about it? Um, is it usajobs.gov? Yeah, uh, so if I'm correcting what he's asking, knowledge bomb, get ready. Here we go. Uh, no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just trying to understand better, Jamie. No, no. It, say, say, say somebody, just, you know, say your typical civilian, or say somebody who had prior service decided that they wanted to work for you guys, but just be a civilian employee. How would yep. they, if you guys have any knowledge on that? Yep, so we do have some, uh, they're called accepted service positions within the Guard. Um, it's, they're pretty rare, but you can apply for them. And she's absolutely correct on USA Jobs, those posts on there. Mm -hmm. um, 
but we, yeah, they're out there. They, I mean, they're, they're few and far between, but we have quite a few of them that you can, you can apply for, um, and not have to be in the, in the military at all. But most of our positions are required that you, uh, you serve in the military has a requirement that you be in the guard to be in the technician position. But right. there are some, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of them. They're like title five accepted positions. I think they're called. Title five. Right. Yeah. That's, that's what I was thinking of. So, um, it is possible. And, and we do recommend those to people that are, are interested, um, at that point, um, in, right. maybe they, or they don't qualify for service with us when we uh, go through the recruiting process for some reason, I usually keep a list of them. Um, and then I reach back out to them if I see those jobs post and, and provide that to them. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good. The thing about those Title Five positions are they get you in the federal system for the most part because most people will go through the TSA, right, to get in the federal GS scale. But this Title Five position could be, I know on our side, we have multiple admins that are civilians, never been in the military, but mm -hmm. they're right here with us and, you know, serving in their own way. So, right, so, right. But, um, mm -hmm. And this is something that I have to uh, make a comment on for you guys. Um, recently, you folks posted out that uh, on the Army side that, that you guys are now accepting that you've been authorized to accept women into combatant roles, which to me, that's been a long, long process. Yes. Because I remember meeting the first woman ever assigned to my stepdad squadron, the 380th, uh, 380th missile, um, yeah, munitions maintenance squadron. Mm -hmm. And that was awesome. And Very the, cool. Air Force, right. the Air Force has been working on that since then. And that was back in 78 or 79. About time, huh? Oh yeah, about time. <laughs> So that was, that was a pretty exciting time for us too, like uh, yeah. being able to uh, recruit females into our combat units. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a really big deal. Um, all of our units went through um, female integration training. Uh, mm -hmm. We actually had the Canadian Army come down and, and train with us because they've had females integrated for quite some time now. Right. Um, and uh, when I was recruiting with the, the field artillery battery out of Waterbury, um, they actually paired up with us and, and their females came and trained directly with our uh, field artillery females in our, in our field artillery unit. And kind mm -hmm. of, you know, laid the groundwork for, for a, a really strong uh, program in that. So um, it's worked out well. And uh, we've got enough females in the leadership positions now to where we can recruit into any unit uh, within the Vermont Guard um, that any, any female wants to serve in. Good. Good. For sure. And I know with the Air Guard side, they've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. I mean, I, I just recruited uh, one of our first female pilots in a really long time. So, cool. Yeah. It's not number one recruiter for no reason. <laughs> hey, recruiter extraordinaire, Freeman dug me. You know, <laughs> you got that right. You okay. know, the, and the good thing too that I noticed, at least here in Vermont, is the air and army side, we work pretty well together. Oh, yeah. um, you know, as opposed to some of these other states. And I think that, that that's a testament to how, you know, a top boss right. operates. Because um, one thing that he always says is put promoters ahead, right? He doesn't care if you go Army, if you go blue or green. Uh, we all serve the state. Um, I know I've sent a couple of people to the Army side. Because at the end of the day, you want to make sure <laughs> the branch you're joining is for you. I've talked to certain folks and I told them, it'd be miserable in the Air Force. It's, it'd be too preppy, right? Go to the Army, go run a little bit. So... Get a little dirty over on this side, right? Right. You, you don't want to be a pretty boy all the time, you know. Go get dirty a little bit. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I look at it this way. Why I uh, enlisted in the Air Guard was for two reasons. One, I have a thing about water. I don't like drowning. Two, <laughs> look at does. I, I have a serious <laughs> problem with people shooting at me. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so. Don't go to Chicago then. Ever. <laughs> yeah, I go to Chicago. You know, the joke is when, when Air Force folks go to boot camp, the MTI, the, the drill sergeant tells them, welcome to BMT. Ice cream is that way. Promotions are that way. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's so many jokes between the two branches. I absolutely love it. I love yeah, it. Yeah. It's good, though. I, yeah, well, <laughs> um, there is that new branch 
there is that new branch. Space Force. Yeah, we can have lots of fun picking on them. I just think, <laughs> I'll be quite honest, I think that they should have, instead of going with Guardians, I really think that they should have went with Space Cadets. I was just going to say that. Uh, I was going to say if they don't go with Space Cadets, it's going to be really sad, but uh, prime uh, opportunity. <laughs> that comes from our, our creed, right? Guardians. Yeah. 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 But still, come on. I know. <laughs> but, but then again, I, I, I think it's a novel idea, and um, we should have at least wait until the Vulcans made first contact. Come on. <laughs> We gotta be ready for it though, you know? Come on. <laughs> no, it's good. I, I'm honestly really excited to see where that goes in the future when technology increases. Cause I heard somewhere like technology doubles itself every four years. So yeah, uh, where, yeah. where that ends up in the future is gonna be absolutely amazing, so. Yeah, one of my teacher, well, my sixth grade teacher, he got into the whole topic of future shock. The way that technology changes exponentially. Oh yeah. So, yeah, I'm just thinking about it, like it doubling itself every four years. Like that's wild. So, and like we're gonna benefit from that too as it as it moves forward too. Right. You know, like our, our weapon systems and our our computer systems and everything that we use as technology is gonna it's gonna be pretty cool. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, it'll be interesting. Yeah. It will be interesting. But um, I'd like to thank you all. I also like to thank Major Dentweiler and mm -hmm. Senior Master Sergeant Davis for making this all possible. And until next time. Yes, it was the, fun. May the force be with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, you have a nice one. Me too. Me too. Bye -bye. See ya. Bye-bye.